President Biden has made history by explicitly describing the 1915 massacre of Armenians by Ottoman Turks as a genocide. Biden issued the statement Saturday to mark Armenian Remembrance Day. He wrote, quote, Over the decades, Armenian immigrants have enriched the United States in countless ways, but they've never forgotten the tragic history. He said, We honor their story. We see that pain. We affirm the history. We do this not to cast blame, but to ensure that what happened is never repeated. He went on to say, the Armenian pe the American people honor all those Armenians who perished in the genocide that began 160 years ago today, unquote. On April 24, 1915, the Ottoman Empire began a systematic, premeditated campaign targeted the Armenian people, an unarmed Christian minority living under Turkish rule. More than a million Armenians were exterminated through direct killing, starvation, torture and forced death marches. Another million fled into permanent exile. Biden's just the second U.S. president after Ronald Reagan to describe the mass killings as genocide. Turkey decried Biden's decision and summoned the U.S. ambassador in Ankara in protest. For decades, Turkey has lobbied lawmakers in Washington to avoid calling the massacres genocide. This is a spokesperson for Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan. First of all, the statement by the U.S. president is very unfortunate, unfair. We completely reject it, condemn it. Uh, it is not supported by historical facts. Uh, it has no legal basis. And uh, politically speaking, it's an irresponsible, uh, um, unconstructive uh, statement. But Armenians have welcomed President Biden's statement, recognizing the genocide. We are thankful that Joe Biden, in his first year after presidency, has already acknowledged the genocide, used the correct term, shared our sorrow, and also uh, made an appeal to the world that such hate crimes, such crimes against humanity, shouldn't be forgotten. We're joined now by Peter Balakian, professor of humanities in the Department of English at Colgate University. He's the author of The Burning Tigress, The Armenian Genocide and America's Response. In 2016, Professor Balakian won a Pulitzer Prize for his poetry collection, Ozone Journal. His new article for The Washington Post is headlined, To Armenians, Biden's Recognition of the Genocide Means the World. Talk about what it means, Professor Balakian. Well, thank you for having me back. It's good to be with you. Um, it's an important statement uh, f for many reasons. And first one needs a little bit of context here, because the Turkish government's campaign, and I'll quote the uh, distinguished uh, international legal scholar Richard Falk, the Turkish government's campaign is a major, proactive, deliberate government effort to use every possible instrument of persuasion at its disposal to keep the truth about the Armenian genocide from general acknowledgment, especially by elites in the United States and Western Europe. So uh, our listeners need to get a sense of how extreme uh, the Turkish government's efforts to deny history uh, then uh, by subsequent act to demonize the victims in order to rehabilitate themselves, how extreme this propaganda campaign has been. And so it's been important for other nations to acknowledge the Armenian genocide often by legislative resolution. And I'm happy to say the U.S. government did this, both the Senate and the House did this in the fall of 2019, joining 30 other countries in Europe, the Middle East, and South and North America. Um, so there's been a worldwide rejection, and I think I could even call it a kind of ethical outrage against Turkey's denialism. And so President Biden has now added an important voice to a world movement. And because the U.S. is such a major power and President Biden has become in such a short time a really important moral leader, bringing the U.S. back into its moral force as a nation in the community of nations, this statement uh, carries a lot of um, ethical 
weight, and uh, again, a redress to a very corrupt and uh, what I would call an immoral campaign to, uh, you know, deny history and perpetrate a kind of violence against the survivor community. In a moment, I want to ask you to read one of your poems, but can you give us the background? I talked a little about what the Armenian genocide looked like, but explain to us what happened. Well, using the cover of World War I, a little bit the way the Nazis used the cover of World War II, as a screen behind which they could execute a campaign to exterminate, to eliminate um, a targeted minority group, a hated minority group that the ruling party, in the case of the Ottoman Empire, the Committee of Union and Progress Party, the Unionist Party, deemed the Armenians to be um, an obstreperous minority group that was clamoring for civil rights and equal treatment for Christians and Jews under Ottoman law. This was a big part of the Armenian civil rights project from the 1890s down through the 19-teens. Armenians were pushing the political envelope, asking for some major change inside Ottoman Turkey. And this was met with massacre as putative act, especially in the 1890s and the early years of the 20th century. But when the war broke out, the ruling elite in Turkey decided they had an opportunity to eliminate the entire Armenian population, a population of between 2 and 2.5 million people who were living on their indigenous homelands, as were the Greeks and the Assyrians, the two other major Christian populations of the Ottoman Empire, living on their indigenous homelands. And it's worth noting that both other Christian minority populations, Assyrians and Greeks, were also wiped out. Uh, before World War I and its aftermath was over, about four million Christians disappeared from Turkey. And so the plan was systematic, and it started with the arrest of the Armenian cultural uh, and intellectual leaders on the night of April 24 in Istanbul, then Constantinople, and it involved the implementation of parliamentary acts, military intervention, mobilization of killing squads in order to arrest and deport every Armenian family from Turkey between 1915 and Pro 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 probably, I would say, the end of the summer of 1916, when about a million and two, uh, a million point two Armenians uh, were killed. More would be killed in the ensuing years, and another million would be exiled. Um, rape, abduction, forced conversion took the lives of another 200,000 Armenian women and children in particular. So this was an important event in the history of modern human rights atrocities. And it is significant that Adolf Hitler said eight days before invading Poland in 1939, who today, after all, speaks of the annihilation of the Armenians. <laughs> Hitler learned something from this event. Professor Balakian, could you read your poem after the survivors are gone? Oh, happy to. I suppose the, the assumption behind a poem like this is that historical memory matters for many reasons, personal, ethical, uh, humane, and I hope this poem picks up a little of that after the survivors are gone. I tried to imagine the Vilna ghetto, to see a persimmon tree after the flash at Nagasaki, because my own tree had been hacked, I tried to kiss the lips of Armenia. At the table and the altar, we said some words written ages ago. Have we settled for just the wine and bread for candles lit and snuffed? Let us remember how the law has failed us. Let us remember the child naked waiting to be shot on a bright day with tulips blooming around the ditch. We shall not forget the earth, the artifact, the particular song, the dirt of an idiom, 
things that stick in the ear. Peter Blakian is the Pulitzer Prize-winning Armenian-American poet and professor at Colgate University. Before we go, since you are a professor, can you briefly—we just have about 30 seconds or a minute—talk about Turkey's success in colonizing American universities, endowing chairs um, that would then, these professors, would deny the Armenian genocide? And does this continue through to today? Well, there was a movement uh, by the Turkish government to do this, and we saw its most virulence in the 1990s. Uh, this happened at Princeton University with a, a scholar who was, or an alleged scholar who was hired to uh, promote this denial project in, uh, in, in the academy. I'm happy to say that so much good scholarship by so many scholars worldwide, has so eroded and rebuffed Turkish denial that today Turkish denial is a laughing stock. The Turkish government is a laughing stock in the face of the rest of the world. And it would be so important for Turkey to move forward, to stop the denialism, to let go of this racist hate project against its, ra against its ethnic minority cultures. Uh, including the Kurds today, to start embracing democracy, human rights, and diversity. The fact that Turkey has more journalists in jail than any country in the world over the last several decades, according to Human Rights Watch and Amnesty International, tells us something. 